Where did it all start, bro? Because like <clears throat> my introduction, as ignorant as it may sound to you, of course, was everyday struggle. That's not ignorant. But again, what, what I said earlier, I'm always aware of my, my like my peers. Yeah. Doing research, I found out that no, nah, you was you you was qualified to be there. So I found that out through me seeing you on everyday struggle. So I'm yeah. wondering, I didn't see that. What? How did it start for you? What do you mean everyday struggle? No, nah, like just you becoming this Wayne No guy and this. Well, Wayne No. I mean, the thing is, the Wayne No. That's my father's. That was my father's nickname. Um, I'm I'm a second. I'm not a junior. I'm a second. So growing up, my nickname was Little Wayne until I got tall enough, and then people just started calling me Wayne. And then Wayne O was my because my father's middle name was a O. So mm-hmm. people used to call him Wayne O, and then that just transpired to me. And the crazy thing about it was like in Harlem. There's two other Waynos and they was like really treacherous people. So and one and one of them was my home. I know both of them. One of them passed away, but um I used to get like flack from people that would hear shit about them, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And think it's me. So um for me, Wayno started as me just being a kid, navigating, living in the Bronx and then moving to Harlem as a teenager. You know what I'm saying? And and um just trying to stay out of trouble, but getting into trouble mm-hmm. and and learning myself and 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 not being myself and not being comfortable with myself um, and and being somebody I wasn't until I discovered who I really was. You know what I'm saying? When was that when you discovered who you really was? What age was that, if you could put a number on it? Like 27, 28. Bruh, it's right? crazy because we always talk so much about like 18 being grown, 21, 23. No. And it's like, bro, you're still, you're still I, but learning. Th- I mean, g- keep in mind, right, the whole 18-year-old sh- the 21 year old shit, that's like those are rules that has been placed before us by people who didn't make those rules for us in the first place right so it's like you know it, times was different when my mom was a kid and her mom was a kid so there was a sense of urgency back in those times to be an adult because that meant your survival how mature you were mm. now as we got older and like every generation like the parenting changes and like, you know, I kind of, my mom had me when she was 21. So, and I was the only child for 10 years and, and my mom was my dad's six baby moms. So like, I grew up with my moms, you know what I'm saying? And then my moms had my sister when she was 31. And sometimes I look at when becoming, now I'm 41, I look back at the woman my mom was or the man my pops was at those times. And in those times, it helps me understand a little bit more about them. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, um. I don't subscribe to that whole, oh, you 18, you could get out and live on your... Who knows anything when they're 18? Yeah. I, I, yo, and, and what I've noticed more, like, when it comes to men, I'm a, like, as a man, I'd be accountable for other men in the sense of, like, um, my generation of men didn't really take the time to raise the next generation of men. But when I look at it from an overall standpoint, the ones over me didn't do that good of a job either. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody likes to act like their uh their time was the best time. Oh man, at least when we was killing, it was over drugs and territory. What? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, so people act like like there's this moral or you know, there's this moral high ground that they could stand like moral on. Code. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. there's no that's no cold. My yeah. kids was getting kidnapped, all types like of crazy. Hit- we hear that like bro back in my day when it was, it's the streets woman like woman and children was off limits like what man it was? wasn't no women and children <laughs> off limits bro that is the most ridiculous thing bro yo I, and that's what that's from a movie mm. just talking about Scarface yo no women no children meantime go look up statistics from every year of every place where it was poverty it was men and it was women and children dying mm. by stray bullets by drugs by all types of shit so it's like I don't really want to harbor on the negative but I'm just saying it's like as a people, like we always trying to talk about like how better we did it, how better, how good we doing it, and we all we the segregation became amongst ourselves. Mm. Once we got together, we segregated from amongst each other. I right? I'm from the east side, you know what I mean, of Harlem, east side of Harlem. Like I'm not gonna say we don't rock with the west side, but but personality wise, we totally different, mm. totally different. I will give you an example: Kim and Mace, they from the west side. Jim Jones from the east. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so like, it, it, person that like that's too different. Like, that's yeah, yeah. And, and one and another thing, the East Side is the same everywhere. I've been to Detroit, 
East Side is, oh yeah, everybody think that they dirty. That's crazy. That they grimy. It's the, the same, same thing. That's crazy. It's the East Side and the West Side is the same That's place insane. everywhere. And they be like, oh, they don't get, we be the ones getting money not talking about it. That's West Side be the ones getting money flashy with it. That's crazy that you said. I've lived, I've lived a long time, bro. Bro, that's insane <laughs> that you said that. That's just I got me some up. experience. Like in Baltimore, we say that like East Side is cruddy. Like they will, they will they rob, it, rob like, any. <laughs> that's what they say about West, the East Side. Bro, West Side flashy, fly. Uh, you know what I mean? All that glitz and glam. You know what I mean? That's crazy. But it's the same. But that's what it showed me. What it what that really showed me when I started learning that from going to being in South Central, being in. You know, I haven't. I wouldn't say I spent a lot of time in Baltimore, but excuse me, I've come across a lot of brothers and sisters from Baltimore. Um, being in New York, Jersey, whatever, is that poverty is the same everywhere. I say that all the time. We yeah. be acting like, yo, Chicago got it so crazy. It's the same, it's the same Facts. poverty, bro. Yeah, it is. It is. I that, just, I, I, I lived in Maryland before too. Yeah, you said you hated it. Yeah, I hated it. But Maryland is in Baltimore, though. You know that. It isn't, but I mean, it's one of the same. No, it's not. I mean, it, it's not, but it wasn't even. It wasn't like it, the reason why I hate it is because, like, for you, for instance, when you was in the seventh grade, imagine if you'd have had to go live in the Bronx. You t like, you say do and to and coo and you know what I mean? What the f was that? I don't know. That's how I <laughs> talk. But they would have been frying you. So when I get to Maryland, they're frying me, bro. They listening to. House music, I'm like, this shit is trash. Yeah. They are wilding me up on the bus going to school every day. I understand. Every when I went to college, wanted... they were listening to Google music. I didn't know what the fuck it was. I'm like, what is this? Bro. Yeah, like bro. that's why I said it's different, bro. Like being in Baltimore, yeah. even though DC is an hour up the street, right? It's like we ain't it's culturally different. Yeah, it's way but see, different. But, but, but that's what I'm saying, right? So like, but that's what like you said when Wayno starts, it's like it's all of these things, bro. Mm. It's 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 my childhood, it's my um you know, my teenage years, it's my, my 20s, my 30s. And it's all like, I, I'm really a, a, my father really revered me highly because he told me that out of all his kids, I was the only one that was exactly like him. Mm. And I love it, but I hate it. You know what I mean? I, I love that, but I hate it. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it is what it is. That's life. But what about, um, when I say, I guess, Dwayne knowing, because the thing that I learned mm -hmm. about the coming of age, we talking about how I was introduced introduced mm -hmm. with uh, everyday struggle was you were really big on Twitter. That's what I, I've heard. I don't know how true that was. Yeah, but I, I don't even know what that meant. Cause, all right. Uh, just to, to to add to you, what you just said, right? Like Twitter was something that my friend Amir, my my brother Amir Bassi, he named my son. He told me I used to be on MySpace. And when I was on MySpace, one thing I used to do is like I would also I would you know how old are you? I'm thirty two. Thirty two. You was on MySpace? Yeah, yeah, I was on MySpace. She was like, all right, so on MySpace, you could write like. No, I was popping. That was prime. Was popping, I was, yeah. yeah, I was on MySpace. All right, so so on MySpace, I would write like, if I was feeling something, thinking something, I would write like these long paragraphs. Because I used to have it like this job I was I just used to didn't have to do. So I would write these long paragraphs. And people used to tell me at 22, 23, Yo, you should write a book or you should do this. And then when Twitter came out, Amir was like, yo, you got to make a Twitter. And I was like, I don't want to make one. Every every social media platform, I was like, I ain't making it. And then when I made it, it was just like a few people on there, we just talking shit. And then it went from a few people talking shit to now like rappers is on there talking shit. But remember, I had already had experience in the music industry because I started in the music industry when I was 18. You know so saying? music industry came before Big Wayne No Twitter yeah, Explosion. that was way before, bro. I was Wayno in music way before Twitter existed. I, bro, I worked at Rockefeller Records and I, I got to Rockefeller Records in 2001. How did you get that job? I, I, by going through the mailroom. So, so the way the, the whole, yeah, I've been vocal about this in a lot of my interviews is like, um, I was fucking up in school really bad. My mom was going to send me down south to live with my, my, um, my aunt because I was in gangs and, I was around a lot of people that was hustling and all types of stuff, and I was doing really bad in school, and I had dropped out of school. And my mom was just like, yo, listen, um, if you're not going to go to school, she like, I want you to go back and get a diploma eventually, but she's like, if you're not going to go to school, you got to do something because I'm not going to be working eight hours of a day, coming home, cleaning, cooking for you and your sister, and you just sitting in here. You have to get a job. Mm. So my mom worked. 
my mom's job was she was like she was a uh, her title was a job developer. So she prepared people for the workforce. So she worked for a nonprofit organization, the hood, that like um you got people, let's say she might have somebody from Target reach out and say, yo, we gotta fill this new Target location is open and we gotta fill 50 jobs, semi people. You know what I mean? She would get t take these people and ready them for for the workforce. So teach them how to conduct themselves on an interview, how to talk, look somebody in their eyes, shake a hand, do a handshake the right way, wear their clothes. Because you'd be surprised how many people don't know that. Oh no, for sure. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I worked. I don't know. Probably in Baltimore, y'all probably got the same shit. Like summer youth, like yeah. when you were a kid. Youth works. We call it. Yeah. So it's called summer youth in New York. So I did summer youth a few times, and the lady who was running the summer youth program, she like was in a similar position like my mom. So they had got me an interview with a mailroom, and um, I went. I did the interview because I knew how to talk to people. That's one thing I, I I honed in on, like conversation. Like I knew how to have a conversation. By the time I was five years old, my mom would tell me like people was always impressed with how I could speak, how well I could speak when I was really young. Mm -hmm. So my mom told me how to conduct myself. So I did the first interview, got it. Then I did the second interview. Then it was um, the building that they placed me at. They placed me in a building that was um, eight twenty five Eighth Avenue. Um, all the music labels was in there. It was the Universal building. Mm. You know what I mean? So if you ever been to Universal, it's different than it is now, but it was um, Rockefeller in there, Murder, Inc., Def Jam, um, Tough Gong, which is Bob Marley's, Bob Marley's family's label, um, Bloodline, which was um, DMX's label. I think Rough Riders had an office, but not at the one we was at, at the other building, like a couple blocks away. But I was there, and I was delivering mail as a 17-year-old kid. And then, you know, I just... I was the youngest person in the mailroom. All the dudes that was in there was in their 20s. Some of them was trying to rap. Some of them was just having a regular job. Some dudes was older. When I got in there that first day, I had the year, that year, I, it was the year 2000. That year, I seen the movie backstage. And when I seen that movie backstage, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to get into music. You know what I mean? And um, I got into that shit. And then, well, I got into what was delivering mail. And then I eventually lost my job in the mailroom. And when I lost my job in the mailroom, I just hit my home girl up, Shari. She's the president of um, Rock Nation now, but she was um, Carlene um, Balin's assistant at Rockefeller. And um, I just asked her, me and Shari, I think I'm a year, I don't want to tell Shari age, but I'm like, go a year or two older than Shari, or, you know, we close in age. And I just asked her, I was like, because once I lost that job, I just knew like I didn't have shit to do. And I was probably like, as a teenager, like we said, poverty is the same and generational is like the same, same shit that was happening. like. My friends was going to jail for robberies and selling drugs. And like when I moved to Harlem, bro, every, this was the first place I ever lived in my life where everybody sold drugs. Everybody, bro. Like 12 year olds, 13 year olds selling drugs all day. So I was like, I know what's going to be my fate if I just sit on this block all day. And I, um, I ended up, you know, going and getting an internship. And then that internship grew to a position. Damn, bro, that shit is crazy. I'm listening to it like, it's funny how you fell into it, but how you, I guess, fell into it is somebody else's dream. Like, they wish they could have had Well, no, shit. I'll say that, no, music was my dream when I was a kid. Media was in my dream. Music, I, when I seen backstage, bro, and I seen, like, I remember a scene where I see Tata, and I see Lenny S, and I see Murder, Tata's brother, and then I see, like, Skane, and, like, I knew who Jay-Z was. I knew who DMX was. I knew who Beanie Siegel was and Bleak and DJ Clue and Ja Rule and Method Man and Reb. I knew who all the rappers was, but I didn't know the people that was on the... I know all of these people now, personally, but I didn't know that there was people behind that being a, a kid. Mm. So when I seen Tata, I'm like, I don't know what he do, but maybe I could be him. I seen Lenny, I was like, I don't know what, I, what he do, but maybe I could be him. And then six months... I got a job where I see all of them. It, it It's unconventional. I don't even know. Like, shit was meant for me. Mm. I believe, like, that was for me. And that's why it happened the way it happened. But got into Rockefeller. And when I got into Rockefeller, you know, um, I I ain't make no money there. But, like, that was the years I would have been in college. So me and young Chris always call it our college years because mm. we'd have been in college at that time. You know what I mean? Yo, how much, how much do you contribute... Like you being in there, you seeing everything that happened in Rockefeller and being so early, like with all of your experience, how often is someone able to like penetrate that space not being in those circles? Like somebody that's trying to get into the music industry. I don't know. It's totally different now because like you could DM somebody now 
and they could, or you could go to an event, you could like go to an event and see like, like when I was, bro, when I was a teenager, like you, the, the, even a way, like, I, I skipped over a very, very important part of my story. Omieli McIntosh, who ran Jay-Z's fan club called Fan Fam, because I was like the youngest kid, I was a teenager when I was in the mailroom, like I would help her after work with sending out like stuff to fans. So I would just like, I guess that was like kind of like me interning. I would help her after work, like ship stuff. She was the one, and she grew up with Jay and all of them. You know what I mean? So her sister, I think, I can't remember what Dara's position was at Rockefeller, but her sister worked at Rockefeller. Rockefeller and it was on, they was on 29, and my floor that I ran was on the 20th floor. And that's how I got like familiarity, because my floor wasn't Rockefeller floor. But I would go up and down there all the time doing inter-office mail because... um. On, the fan club was on the 20th floor. So she helped me a lot. You know what I mean? Because I used to tell her, like, yo, I remember one time I asked, I said, I said, yo, you think I could meet Jay-Z one day and I could hang out with him for like an hour? And she was like, no. <laughs> She's like, you could meet him, but you ain't hanging out with him for an hour. And I was a kid, you know what I mean? And um, she helped me with my vision. Because I remember one time I said to to to, to um, Omi, she asked me about my friends and I said, I said, it's like 20, I said, I had like 20 friends that I hung out with at this time. And I was like, she said, what are they doing? I was like, 10 of them is like in jail and like five of them is dead. Mm. And she was like, what? Like the same thing if a kid told you that today. You'd be mm. like, what the fuck, what you mean? Yeah. And she was, so I, I felt like she didn't feel compelled to help me, but she saw that I had some ambition. I feel like all of them seen ambition in me as a child. That's what made, help, help them, help me, help them, help me. Hmm. If that makes sense. So even like still talking about like breaking into this, this music industry. I don't know how you do it today. It, sound, it sounds like a lot back then was like nepotism, like a lot of family and like. I, yes and no, because even for me, it wasn't no nepotism. I'm not, I'm from Harlem. All yeah. of them is from Brooklyn. I didn't know none of these people. So my personality is really what got me in the door. And my 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 um punctuality as far as time. Like if they told me like, I like if I seen Omi, if I was going around the floor and I would get off at five o'clock. Right, and Omi would be saying, "Wayne, you think you can help me later?" I'd be like, "Yup, I, I, I don't care what the fuck I had go. I don't care because at this, I still lived with my moms. You know what I'm saying? I was a teenager, so I still lived at home with my moms. And at that time, like, I think my little sister was able to walk home from school. Yeah, because her school was across the street, so she was able to walk home. So I'm like, "Yeah, I'm staying. Like, whatever y'all need me to do." And even when I got the um intern position, because this is another thing, I seen a it's a lot of people. I'm not, don't get it twisted. It's a lot of motherfuckers that was in the same position as me that didn't go nearly a quarter where I went. Mm. But that's because a lot of people, like intern, a lot of the interns, they were relying on like their college education. Like, yo, I go to Howard and yeah, I'm interning here, but I'm going to be doing such and such next year and I'm going to get a job and, and come to find out that like academic education, education helps, but academic education has nothing to do with you. I'm a high school dropout, I'm, a, I'm an executive. I couldn't be an executive no, in no other company without a diploma. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't be an executive at Costco without a high school diploma. So like, my me being adamant, me being punctual, me being proactive and not reactive, like I'm not waiting for nobody to tell me what to do. I'm doing it. And I just ask for forgiveness after mm. if you don't like what I did. Well, so I was like, I just was... So the nepotism thing, I, I'm pretty sure it works because shit, my kids benefit off of what I do. Uh, but at the same time, it wasn't like they was hiring their children in there. It wasn't they, you know what I mean? Like only person that was a um, relative that I knew, I mean, Dame had a few of his people in there, like his brother, Bobby ran radio, Bobby Dash, shout out to Bobby Dash. He ran radio. Um, Darian, Darian Dash, I think he ran finance. And I forgot, um, Carlton, um, he passed away, but he was running the finance division. Like he was the CFO of Rockefeller. Dame had his people on top of shit, but you know, I ain't really see, I can't say I seen too much nepotism. And I was a kid, I didn't really give a fuck about even business at that time. So I didn't care about what was going on. Yeah, so all right, so painting this picture, of course, we still talking about like this build up to getting on Everyday Struggle for my, because that was how I was introduced, right? Yeah. So we go from Rockefeller, 17, 18, 19, to this MySpace era, to this Twitter era. You was going into the Twitter era. How was you able to go from the MySpace is right in your, your your thoughts to your man telling you create Twitter and then it exploding. I don't. See, that's what I'm saying. I don't. I don't know how people. So look, people would tell me, "Oh, you Wayne off of Twitter." Mm -hmm. 
But that's just I, I use Twitter to kill time. So you don't recognize that though. You you gotta at I, least I recognize, recognize it, it, but I didn't. That, that wasn't. Th this is what I'm saying. That didn't have me being on Twitter. Didn't have nothing to do with me being on Everyday Struggle. I'm gonna tell you what got me on Everyday Struggle. It wasn't Twitter. Twitter was just a pastime. Twitter did. I'm gonna tell you what Twitter did help me. In 2012, I had a job. I was working at Channel 11. In the mailroom. Again, after Rockefeller, when Dame and Jay broke the shit up, I was in the mailroom again, working at two different mailrooms. One for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals and another one for Pix11. Um, I still had... Remember, I got all these relationships. I lived with Beanie Siegel. Mm. I, me and the Young Guns, we the same age, so we was all on the... Everything that they was doing when they was getting their chains to doing their first music videos, I was around for all of that. So I had relationships with them and I had relationships with other people because of them. Um... In 2012, I said I, I lost my I, I lost my job, and I was like, "Yo, I'm gonna give myself some time to do something I want to do." So I was a brand ambassador for Reebok, and um, that was paying me a thousand dollars a month. In 2012, I was 29. You know what I mean? I was making a thousand dollars a month for Reebok, and I was doing you know other little odd jobs to make money. I was in SOBs one time. I can't remember for whose show, but I was backstage. I remember Lil Durk being there, and this was like when Lil Durk was first starting. He was running around with uh, slow bucks in them. You know what I mean? Because I got a great, I got a good relationship with Meek Mill because I, I met Meek Mill. I know Meek Mill since he was sixteen because of my ties to Philly. You know what I'm saying? This is crazy. Now I got a lot of I, this I, I, is crazy. So so um, like I know Me I know Meek before he caught the charge that kind of was the backdrop of his career. Yeah, you say you stand with Beanie, and but that's not. I met I met Meek from Oskino. Okay, you know what I mean? But but um, it's a lot of knowledge. This it's a whole lot of crazy. shit. But when I was backstage at this show, I f I was talking to somebody. I don't know what the fuck I was talking about, but it was this dude named Pat Swiss. He was the booker for SOBs, and he was like, "Yo, what's your name?" And I was like, "Wayno." And he's like, he just was listening to me, and he's like, "Yo, you got a Twitter?" And I was like, "Yeah." So he goes on my Twitter. Like five or six minutes later, he came back. He's like, "Yo, I want you to host shows here." I was like, "For what?" He was like. Cause you got personality. I was like, personality? What the fuck? I like I could not grasp what personality meant, bro. Keep in mind, as as intelligent as I am today, I am a high school dropout. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's certain shit that just don't register to me. And and I don't, I'm not saying that in a negative connotation. I'm just saying like when it comes to grammar, when it comes to certain things, it's just certain things didn't make sense to me. So a person telling me that I have a personality that he wants to put me on a stage so I can um Host a show makes no fucking sense. I'm like, he said, I pay you. I said, how much you gonna pay me? He said, on a good night, I pay you 150. On a bad night, $50. Mm. But it, be, it might be some nights where you ain't gonna get paid. I said, all right. I said, let me let, let me think about it. That night, I was I was leaving. And my man, Low Key, you know Low, he do the show with Ebro mm -hmm. and Nadeska. Mm -hmm. We was on a train together. So I, And Low, he was hosting shows and shit. So I asked Lo, I said, yo, Lo, they want me to host shows and in, 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 uh, SOBs. I was like, I don't know what to do, though. I said, you, th I said, you think I could do it? He's like, hell yeah, I think you could do it. He's like, but I'll teach you. He's like, if anything you want to learn, I'll teach you. I was like, for real? He's like, yeah. So he started telling me. I can't remember exactly what he said, but by the time I got off the train, I had an understanding of like what I had to do. I started hosting shows, right? So I'm hosting shows and shit. That was a direct connect to Twitter. But I started hosting shows. The first show I host was some, I can't remember. I remember the biggest show I hosted was Abso first show in New York, and he brought out Kendrick Lamar. And this was when Kendrick had when Good Kid Sid, Good Kid, Good um Good Kid Bad City just just came out. Mad City just came out, and um then I hosted some French Montana shows and I hosted a few other shows. And I was just trying to do, bro. I had at that time I started a a, a streetwear line. I was doing anything, my nigga, because I was trying to figure out. Nigga, you about to have your third kid. You ain't got no fucking money. You live in a one-bedroom apartment with your girl. How the fuck you going to make something? Like, nigga, you got to make something of yourself. So I'm doing everything, anything I could find, all types of whatever. And hosting those shows is how I meet Davies. Mm. And then once I meet Davies, I was hosting a show. It was a New Harlem showcase. Davies was on it. He rapped, and I always say this, it wasn't that East was better than everybody, it's just 
his charisma on the stage. How, like, he just had confidence that I hadn't seen from nobody else. Me and East get cool for, like, a year. And then I just approach him one day, like, because I, I, I was starting my management company. I approach him one day, and I'm like, yo, I was telling everybody, like, yo, I don't really want to get that Dave East kid. So one day I called him. He was at somebody's crib down a block from, from my mom's crib. I go over there and I see him and I'm like, yo, just talking to him. I'm like, yo, bro, like you doing all this yourself? He's like, yeah. I was like, could I help you with anything? He's like, hell yeah. He's like, I be needing help with shit. So I said, I said, who managed you? He's like, nobody. I said, I want to manage you. And he was like, you serious? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, I promise. I'm. He said, he said, yeah, you can manage me. I said, I promise I'm going to make you rich. When he said that, I didn't even know what the fuck I was going to do to make him rich. I just said, I promise that I was going to make him rich. You know what I mean? So I did, and, and what I did was when I got with East, I poured all of my resources from Rockefeller, from everybody I knew, from Rock, Rock. I'm, I knew DJ Drama, like I, like I said, I know Meek, I know a lot of people. Like don't get like I know a lot of people from, cause I don't have a bad name. I ain't never did nobody dirty. I ain't never stole from nobody. None of that shit. So it's like I always had a good name. So I poured my resources in the East. The way I got on Everyday Struggle was Nadeska was working for MTV. You remember when she was working for MTV? I don't. I don't. All right, no. she was working for MTV when she, they had Rap Fix Live. It was her, Rob Markman, Sway, and she was doing um, interviews, and she came uptown and interviewed East, and that's how I met Nadeska, and I kept in touch with Nadeska, like the same way how you kept in touch with me. I kept in touch with Nadeska, and when Everyday Struggle first started, I was a fan like everybody else watching, and then... That's 2017. In, 20, in, the, in 2017, the end of 2017, I stopped working with East. I started working with East in 2014. We stopped working together in 2017. And in January, here I am. Nigga, what the fuck are you going to do? Because now I done moved out the hood. My bills is different. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I, don't, I live in a gated community now. I got more than one car. Got, and Deska calls me. And she's like, no, I text her. Because she was on there with Star. Remember when they brought Star on? Mm -hmm. She's on there with Star. And I um I text her on some Hunt Star was having like a back and forth. And I text her, I said, Yeah, talk your shit. She hit me back two weeks later. She's like, yo, my fault. You know, she's like, my fault I ain't hit you back. Um, but yo, you should come on the show and debate with us one day. I was like, for real? And she like, yeah. So I'm like, all right. I went on that show that one time and I stayed for three years. 